Hi folks, this is Jacob Grace, and you're listening to Perennial AF, the Savannah Institute's podcast and blog about perennial agroforestry. This year is the 10th anniversary of the Savannah Institute. And in this episode, we're gonna be looking back at the Institute's roots. I'll be talking with two people who have been at the core of the Savannah Institute over the last 10 years, Kevin Wohls and Keith Keeley. Kevin Wohls was part of the network of researchers and farmers who founded the Savannah Institute back in 2013 and served as the first chair of the Institute's board of directors. Keith Keeley was the first employee of the Savannah Institute, hired as executive director in 2014. Beginning in 2017, Keith and Kevin worked together for five years as co-executive directors of the Savannah Institute. During those five years, the organization went from being a scrappy startup with three part-time employees collectively doing the work of one full-time staff person to being a thriving nonprofit with over 20 employees that had purchased land in southern Wisconsin to establish a home farm and had launched a spin-off business called Canopy Farm Management to provide for-profit support for Midwest agroforestry. Keith Keeley continues to serve as executive director of the Savannah Institute, while Kevin Wohls is now CEO of Canopy Farm Management. Earlier this month, I met with them over Zoom to talk about the origins of the Savannah Institute. I started by asking them what they'd been nerding out about lately, and by telling them about a book I'd been reading by Mark Twain. My favorite Mark Twain line is, there are lies, damned lies, and statistics. (laughs) (laughs) He has so many good quotes, both funny and serious, and I used one of them yesterday, which was um, a gentleman is a man who knows how to play the banjo, but doesn't. (laughs) So I don't know if that makes me a gentleman or not. (laughs) My mom would appreciate that. She's a banjo player. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Well, gee, I feel like most of what I nerd out about these days is the technology and equipment side of things thinking about just how do we make all this more efficient and effective. Um, Yeah. I mean, you know, the amount of effort and investment spent over the last hundred years on row crop oriented technology is just kind of mind boggling and compare that to the amount of investment and time spent on tree oriented equipment is just minuscule. And so in a way that's, I mean, we can benefit from all the stuff that the row crop, uh, folks have worked on because you know a lot of the tech can be can be moved over and applied, but uh, we're just at the tip of the iceberg really when applying it all to trees. So there's a lot of low hanging fruit to to work on. So we'll start with those, I guess. Yeah, is the low hanging fruit easier to harvest mechanically than the not low hanging <laughs> fruit? <laughs> Sorry, there are going to be a lot of more of those anyway. as we get into it here. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Kevin, that sounds a lot like um, one of the first episodes we did was with Eric Wolski and he was basically Mm -hmm. talking about like, why are we still planting trees the same way we did a hundred years ago when we have tractors that can drive themselves? (laughs) So yeah, yeah, we had a lot of fun talking about that. Um, and Keith, I think we got a quote from you, but we didn't actually get something you're nerding out about. So we better circle back here. Well, this is, uh, the first thing that came to mind is much less tree related, but, um, this morning as my five-year-old, was getting ready for preschool. She asked me, Papa, if the world is round, why does it seem flat? (laughs) And so that was a great, got to nerd out with, uh, we found a ball and talked about if there was a little person walking around the ball, what it was, what it would be like. And I got to tell her about when I got to travel around the world in a, in a year that I was traveling. And it's been um, really fascinating to see the the world through the eyes of a five year old who's just like starting to comprehend much bigger things. She's been interested in learning about ancestors too, and you know, the mm. people that span generations, and then talking about dinosaurs and all that too. So time and space are very sort of trippy to nerd out on when you're <laughs> a, a five year old learning about the world. That is cool. It's fun to be with someone who's just kind of like thinking through that for the first time and 
realizing how hard it is to explain. <laughs> yeah. So now that you're both uh, launching these careers as kind of professional Loraxes where you're speaking for the trees and, and working for the trees, uh, I guess looking back even before Savannah Institute, do you remember any any moments from earlier in your life that kind of gave you a, a hint that that you might be doing what you're now doing someday? Yeah, I mean, I don't know about a yeah particular moment necessarily. I mean, my my path to arrive at trees and agroforestry was um, uh, I don't know, I guess a bit unexpected because I did not grow up in an agricultural community or in a, a family that farmed. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, um, but happened to be in the suburbs uh, that are surrounded by by forest preserves and, and parks. And so um, in high school, I, I started getting involved in just uh, habitat restoration. So kind of pure ecological restoration, um, again, not not agriculture by any means, and um, really fell in love with that, really kind of discovered nature as this this big inspiration from me decided i want to be a biologist went down that whole path and and then when i arrived down in central illinois um for college there really wasn't like i was used to going out and finding a, a degraded forest or prairie to go and you know tear out the invasives and restore it but at least you had something there to to work with and then i arrived in central illinois and like there, there really wasn't much to like it's, it's, it's not there anymore. So I had to really quickly reconcile. Okay, well, we have to, we obviously have to have all these acres here making money and growing food, and we we need to we need to eat. But like we also need to do this this restoration thing. We, we you know we 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 need nature back to to combat the climate crisis and all these things. And so really had to start reconciling those two things, and then discovered agroforestry and tree crops and that things kind of just you know then waterfall down all of that um so it was it was interesting that kind of going to the belly of the beast sometimes i call it down in 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 in, in the corn belt and kind of seeing this vacuum and then realizing okay there's there's it can't be black and white what's what's the gray area in the middle where we can be working yeah i like the idea of uh, how do you do habitat restoration when you have no habitat left to begin with, or it's just like bare ground. That's, that's interesting. And then I also wanted to ask, it, is it true that your dad has a construction business or, or did have? Yeah, or, he was, he was in construction. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I see some connections between that and doing canopy where you're kind of coming in and not building buildings, but building infrastructure and working with a lot of the things that, I don't know. It seems similar to me to, to having a construction business in some ways. Yeah. I mean, I think what, um, to me, something that has for me had to be so front and center is keeping, keeping the optimism present while kind of working on all this, because I mean, all of us are showered every day, left and right with, the latest symptom of the climate crisis rearing its head. And it, you know, every year we get, to, we get an update from the IPCC about just how horrible things are. And it sometimes it's really hard to keep your head up, keep focused, keep optimistic, like, okay, we can still manage this. And, um, but, you know, but, but we have to. And, um, I think that, uh, from my childhood and, and, you know, from my parents really kind of taught me always that, that like, yeah, there's always a solution. We we can figure it out. You know, my dad working in the garage tinkering. Like, if there's something broken, it's, there's never a like, oh, we got to go buy a a new thing. Like, no, we we can fix this. There's there's a way to do it. <laughs> it may take a little bit of time, but we can do it. And I think that kind of optimism um, and just kind of uh, proactive kind of attitude has been really instrumental in being able to keep that optimism front and center as we as we still try to plow ahead in spite of the accelerating climate crisis. Metaphor than plow ahead though, Kevin. Uh, that's a great story though. I, I love it all. I, I knew you were going to say that. I knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how many of, of our of our phrases, I mean, here in the Midwest at least, how many of our phrases come out of agricultural <laughs> culture. <laughs> 
out of the woods yet. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, what if we need to get back in the woods? Maybe that's where we're supposed to <laughs> yeah. be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've never heard that before, Kevin, just in particular. I know your dad, Jim, is a great person to have around when you're on any project, but um, that's that makes a lot of sense hearing about his influence on just the kind of let's fix this mentality. Yeah. Yeah. And how about you, Keith? Yeah, well, I, I would have no excuses if I wasn't trying to do something with trees because I was fortunate to, to grow up in, in the woods. Um, and and there's an old photo of my mom when I was a Cub Scout with our little Cub Scout pack, like planting trees, little kids with shovels on Earth Day, something like that. Um, and then my dad worked at apple orchards too. He, he picked apples um, and, um, and then my dad went on uh, to work for 30 years at Organic Valley. And so my, my parents weren't farmers, but lived in a farming area and kind of got inoculated with it and worked on apple orchards myself when I was in high school. And then I went off to college and kind of forgot about agriculture. Nobody in suburban Philadelphia was thinking about farming at all. Um, but it, I never quite lost the bug, even as I was studying ecology and, and um, forest ecology. So then I had the opportunity to live on farms, uh, traveling around the world. And I think that helped me see that the way that we, maybe kind of the opposite of Kevin in the belly of the beast. Like I really saw clearly that in a lot of places, th- they don't call it agroforestry, they just call it farming. And what seems like a radical idea to a lot of folks doing farming here, that you could grow a bunch of crops in the same place and that trees would be a part of your farming systems. Um, it's just the way they do it in a lot of places in the world and have for a long time and it works incredibly well. Um, so it, it never seemed quite as radical to me. It's, and from another perspective, it's sort of strange that the way we do agriculture here is just growing one thing um, and having to replant it every year. And, um, yeah, so I think that that is part of my opportunity, uh, both growing up and then traveling in other parts of the world to just be able to see that this kind of work to transform agriculture here in the Midwest is um, not so strange, but really um, not only possible even, but necessary. That if we want to continue to be doing agriculture here, a hundred or two hundred years from now, that um, we've we've got to start doing things quite quite a bit differently. So, um, so yeah, I I feel really fortunate to be a part of Savannah Institute where that's that's what we're doing day in and day out, along with a lot of other people that are part of the the community that we're a part of. This year, twenty twenty three, is the tenth anniversary of the Savannah Institute, and um, there there's a lot of context to go along with that, but. Um, I, I think Kevin, you were there in the, for the formation of the Savannah Institute, but Keith was not as, as I understand. So Kevin was there, I guess what I'm kind of curious about is like, was there a conversation where there was a group of people that like got together and before this conversation happened, the Savannah Institute did not exist, but after this conversation or, or meeting or whatever it was there, the Savannah Institute did exist at least as an idea. Uh, you know, I don't think there was any single pivotal conversation. I think there was many conversations, probably over many beers, uh, that that kind of got the ball rolling. Um, I think it was more kind of like a series of events or realizations. Uh, you know, it certainly wasn't overnight. Um, yeah, I can kind of paint uh, the basic picture. I mean, um, there's a small group of us at the University of Illinois we were interested in jumpstarting some research around tree crops and agroforestry, and there really wasn't wasn't much happening um, at at the, at the University of Illinois. So it was kind of an uphill battle. Um, some of that is simply attributable to bureaucracy, um, but I think a lot of it is also attributable to just kind of the inherent short sightedness that. Uh, comes with a system built around the two-year master's project. And it's hard sometimes for universities to think beyond that. And um, 
So to, to help uh, to help lubricate things a little bit, we invited Mark Shepard down uh, to give a, an Earth Day uh, talk. And, um, you know, Mark's energy uh, uh, is contagious. And so he helped us get a, a lot more people excited and helped us kind of break down some of those barriers, get some more people on board. And eventually that led to us breaking ground on some some real physical projects in the ground uh, to start doing some research. And just just doing that, just just putting some trees in the ground, putting the university on the map, opening up that kind of conversation seemed to open up this kind of valve in what had been a vacuum in Illinois. Uh, and all this interest started flooding in. All these people started emailing us, calling us, hey, I'm interested in this and I've been you know, looking around for this and and. The problem was like we were researchers. We were we had we didn't have the capacity to do all this kind of education and outreach or consultation or run field days or like that just that wasn't what we were set up to do really. And so, you know, at that time, I mean, the University of Missouri Center for Agroforestry already existed, of course. Um, and you know, of course, there was the university extension system, which in theory this is kind of the kind of thing that they should be doing. But in Illinois, they were kind of getting defunded at that time. So it was just kind of clear to us that there was a lot of demand. People were really interested in these things, farmers and, and, and plenty of other people around the supply chain. But it was clear that both on the research side where we had an uphill battle and on kind of the education front, the the university system just wasn't really cutting it. And there just wasn't enough capacity. Maybe it wasn't the right framework. And so we decided we needed to start something new that could actually fill in that role and, and maybe push some of the boundaries in ways that universities aren't really set up to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the rest yeah. is history. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of hard to put specific names to it, honestly, mm -hmm. and I, I don't want to leave anyone out. So it's probably right. best to just kind of avoid that. But, uh -huh. um, yeah, but I mean, it, it definitely like it, it was um, there was a small group of students, small group of professors, small group of farmers. It was pe people kind of from all over the all over the gamut, kind of all, all just for whatever reason, leading leading kind of kind of the same idea. And, and all of us realizing from our own perspectives that there was a void here that needed to be filled that wasn't that wasn't being filled. Mm hmm. OK. I mean, you know, there was a founding board. There okay. were uh, maybe five, I think, people. I can't remember exactly that four, five, six. Um, and, and, you know, we were all volunteer. We would meet once a month or something and uh, try to figure out what to do next. And, I mean, so technically that was the, you know, there was no, no employees, nothing. It was just for a couple of years. It was just it was just the, or a year, I guess. And then, then Keith was hired as um you know, the first, first kind of true staff person. And so, yeah. um, yeah. So Keith, how did you first hear about the Savannah Institute? And then how did you, how did you become employee number one? Yeah. Um, well, folks who are in Madison or have been a part of the university may have heard of the famous ESSA listserv, uh, which is kind of a catch all email listserv for all kinds of things, including job postings. And, there was some ragtag bunch down in Illinois that was planting some trees or something and were, they were looking for some help. And I saw that come across the listserv and I don't know if I even opened the email, but I, I, <laughs> I was a graduate student. I was working at, uh, at the Farley Center at the time. Some folks listening might know about this great uh, nonprofit incubator farm outside of Madison. And so I didn't need another job helping another nonprofit get started And while well, I was finishing grad school. But um, a friend uh, who I was in grad school with, Anna Cates, had, had seen this posting too. And so she said to me, Keith, I saw this, uh, th uh, this thing going on in Illinois and I thought of you. It seems like something you might be really interested in. So I took another look at it and... Um, and, it, and it did look really interesting, actually, what they, um, what they were starting and, and looking to do more of. And so I thought I would um, connect with them. And, and I, I was very impressed right away just at the, the vision and um, 
frankly, how much they had their act together for a startup group of volunteers. And so, so I was attracted to see what, um, what could happen. And, um, as Kevin said, the rest is history. Great. And so we are celebrating the, the 10 year anniversary this year, but to kind of zoom back a little bit, um, you know, around five years ago, um, there were only three part-time employees, correct? Which Kevin said added up to basically one, one full-time staff member five years ago. So, uh, a lot of what's happened in the last 10 years has actually happened in, in the last five years, we might say. But what what were some of the things that were going on in those those first five years or is kind of embedded within the universities a little bit and people kind of working on the side to get things going? Well, um, so a lot of what Kevin mentioned, you know, in those early days, uh, Savannah Institute was really connective tissue for research that was happening at the university. And, and it started in, in, at Urbana-Champaign, the University of Illinois, but it, it also included starting to connect with other universities, what some of Wisconsin was doing with Hazelnuts and some of the folks in Minnesota working on that too. Uh, I got connected with Purdue Extension that had a small farms program that was doing some agroforestry, building our ties with the Center for Agroforestry in Missouri. And like Kevin said, a lot of our activities were in that sort of uh, connective tissue space with universities and the farming community. And when universities were looking for farmers to partner with, then Savannah Institute, we we had started to build our network through um, one of our first programs was called, we called it the case study program. And really what it was, was a sort of uh, a way for farmers, beginning farmers who were starting to do agroforestry to document some of what they were learning and share with other beginning farmers. Here's what's working, here's what's not working. And uh, and so that was one of the ways that we built up our network early on was farmers who participated in that, in that network. And then um, we also had a bulk plant sales program, we called it. And that was... Um, both a, a fundraiser for the organization early on, but also kind of filled a niche for farmers who wanted to plant a bunch of different kinds of trees, but didn't want to work with a whole bunch of different nurseries because it was hard to know who to order what from and where you could get it. And smaller orders are harder for some nurseries to deal with. So we were a one-stop shop for farmers who wanted to plant trees and we could uh, take their orders and then work with all the nurseries and then send the trees out to the farmers. So um, that was some of what we were doing in those early years. And really the outcome of it was it it got us connected. Like Kevin was saying, it was sort of a gravitational force of people who were interested in this and doing it. Savannah Institute kind of filled that void of a um, a connecting point for people who wanted to be a part of it. Okay. Kevin, anything to add to that? Well, I think just, you know, in those early years, because we were all kind of part-time or volunteers and we also all had the roles that we were playing outside of, of Savannah Institute proper. And so yeah. many of us were either grad students or had some other uh, shoes we were filling elsewhere. And so, um, you know, a, a lot of the important work at that time was also laying the groundwork for agroforestry work in other institutions and in other places and trying to seed those ideas in places where they already had funding and capacity. Uh, mm-hmm. So that was a, a big part of our role at that point, too. Okay. Kevin, at what point did you, what point were you co-executive directors then? January 1st, 2017. And you were co-directors until Canopy spun off? Is that what I remember? Yeah, until January 1st, 2022. Okay. So Thank it's exactly you. five years. Exactly five years, yep. Um, I don't like to do any major life transitions unless it's on January 1st. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. That's a good way to do it. Leo was born on December 25th, though. Yeah, I was trying to keep him in for another another <laughs> couple <of> days. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so then kind of on this, uh, looking back, uh, when was the first PFG? 
and I guess for for podcast listeners, we should say the first perennial farm gathering. So this has become kind of an annual tradition with Savannah Institute. It's kind of our big annual get together event. The last few years, it's been completely online, but for the first several years, it was a big in person event that was kind of meant to serve the purpose of a conference without actually being a conference. In, in 2014, we we had the first unofficial PFG. Yeah, basically uh, around a dinner table on a farm. Uh, and that was maybe 10 people. And then uh, the following year in 2015, it was maybe 30 people um, at, at the at the co-op in Urbana. And then, it's, yeah, grown a bunch ever since. We've done it every year since 2014. Yeah, the year after the the classroom, we went to, to Kate Potter's farm to, um, it, what did we call that when it was a demonstration farm? Um, oh, uh, Sun Dappled. Farm, that's right, yeah. And so that was in, they Kate had a big farmhouse there. We had 40-some people, I think, and Tom okay. Wall gave a keynote message talking about uh, tree crops and and uh, and then the year after that, we moved to Byron Colby Barn in um, Grays Lake, Illinois, up north of Chicago, and that was um, that was Christie's first perennial farm gathering, and she was like a month into working at SI, and so she really got baptism by fire there and <laughs> hosting an event, uh, and and. Um, yeah, that was that was a great event there too. We we did a, a kind of a, a field workshop with the farm there with Jeff and Jen Miller, a kind of a site assessment and design. And then they ended up planting an agroforestry system uh, after the PFG. So cool. I haven't been back there in the five years since we had the PFG there, but I, I'm anxious to go back now and see um, what the trees look like. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think we have some pictures from that on file too, and I can picture the the barn space. Um, and then after that, it went to, it came to Madison, right? To the, um, uh, yeah, that was at, uh, the Lake, Lake Farm Park, uh, yes. south of Madison. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we did that in partnership with Greenlands Blue Waters that year. So that was a great way to build connections with some of the regional organizations and get mm -hmm. some new people introduced to Savannah Institute. And, and that was the first time we had the event in Wisconsin too. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. And um, I, we kind of talked about this a little bit, but what were some of the first research projects or, or field days that you remember the Savannah Institute being a part of? Well, of course, the kind of first project wasn't even a Savannah Institute official project, but the, the, the research site that we established at the University of Illinois um, where I did a lot of my own uh, research at uh, what was, and was kind of started around the same time that SI started. You know, SI was certainly involved in some of the visioning there. And then um, when we would have field days, SI was really involved in the outreach portion of it. And so and SI continues to be involved actually in that, in that research project here, 10 years later, we're actually SI is leading uh, going out and taking the uh, kind of, decade time point uh soil cores and woody biomass carbon assessment and you know 10 years after planting those trees now we're going back and doing the first real kind of comprehensive uh checkup uh at least from a carbon perspective uh so that, that's pretty cool that that it's still going and si is still involved and kind of leading the way there great yeah and then uh, some of the first projects that were officially savannah institute in the lead were uh, grants that we wrote to the um, North Central USDA SARE program, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, I think. And um, the first project we did was called uh, Crop Performance Pests and Pollinators in Diverse Agroforestry Systems. And we worked with a handful of farms um, to compare the, those things, how were the crops growing, and then did some uh, arthropod or insect surveys to see which pests and which pollinators were present in agroforestry systems, and then in um, in uh, row crop and in uh, 
hay fields and forests nearby. So we had some comparisons on what was happening in these young agroforestry systems with the with the insect communities. Um, and that was another project where we, we got some interesting data that actually showed some difference in, in those insect populations. But it also, what the outreach and the community or network building was a really important part of it because we could had some events then and we were partnering with farmers in the research. Um, we did some, uh, with that same grant program, uh, silvopasture establishment study. That was some of our first research projects working with farms in Wisconsin and in Indiana as well. Um, and then we did another uh, project with uh, pioneer agroforestry farmers. That was an education-focused project where we interviewed some of the handful of folks around the Midwest who've been doing agroforestry for a long time to really collect some of their lessons learned and share their stories with a wider audience, which has always been a really important part of Savannah Institute's mission. And what we do is being kind of a a megaphone or a a way for farmers to share their stories and lessons learned with each other. So that's been, uh, I think, a big part of the early and continuing still to this day part of our research and education efforts. Okay, great. You're listening to my conversation with Keith Keeley and Kevin Wohls about the early days of the Savannah Institute. After a break, we'll hear Keith and Kevin talk about their dreams for the future, and they'll face off in a round of agroforestry would you rathers. This podcast is made possible by the Grassland 2.0 Project, which is working to transform Midwest agriculture to perennial agro ecosystems, just like Savannah Institute is. Uh, that was bad. This podcast is... I'm just going to start over. I'm thinking. You can't think and talk at the same time. <laughs> Everybody knows that. I'm proof of that. This podcast is made possible by the Grassland 2.0 Project, which is working to transform Midwest agriculture to perennial agro ecosystems, just like Savannah Institute is. Grassland 2.0 believes that caring for ourselves means caring for the land, and that perennial farming methods like managed grazing and agroforestry are our best option for doing so. You can learn more and get involved at grasslandag.org. Perennial AF is also sponsored by Canopy, a perennial farm management business and tree crop nursery based in Illinois and Wisconsin. Launched in 2022 by the Savannah Institute and Grantham Environmental Trust, Canopy is helping scale up agroforestry in the Midwest by providing plant material and farm management services. You can learn more about what products and services are available in your area at canopyfm.com. And up next, we'll be talking a bit more about how Canopy came into existence. Keith and Kevin will say more about why Savannah Institute has always had a vision for transformational change and how, as Keith says, we're not going to achieve that by doing some nice projects on the margins. Also, if it wasn't clear already, it will become even more obvious that Keith and Kevin are both the parents of small children. We get the impression that um, the Savannah Institute has always had an ambitious vision for for what it wants to achieve, or at least what it wants to support and see in the Midwest. And um, what's been the biggest surprise over the last 10 years of kind of starting with this transformational vision and trying to work towards it? I mean, to, to me, the, the piece of it that's, I think surprises a lot of people is that we talk about transforming agriculture. And agriculture and the food system, it's such a big thing that it, it just seems kind of outrageous that a small nonprofit is going to talk about transforming things. Um, but that's really been in our DNA from the beginning is seeing that if, if we're actually going to make a difference in the landscape and, and biodiversity and in climate, that it's not, we're not going to achieve that by doing some nice projects on the margins and on the edges, that we actually have to change the way we do agriculture out across the broad fields of the Midwest. And so 
planting that flag, I think, has both, you know, seems surprising when people learn that that's actually what we're working on. But it's also been what makes it meaningful for people to to join in what we're doing, whether that's farmers, staff, funders, volunteers, people at field days, because that's that's what on some level we all want. That, you know, we don't all want exactly the same thing, but we can all see that there are some big fundamental things that need to shift and change. And so, um, while that, at first that can seem surprising, that's that vision is also, I think, what's made it so meaningful for people to be a part of Savannah Institute, and has been really the wind in our sails that's moved us ahead uh, through these first ten years on you know building capacity and starting to do work that lays the foundation for that transformation at, at a landscape scale. So that, you know, that, I don't know that that's a single moment. I guess if I was going to talk about a single moment, it would be <laughs> one of the first big donations that we got was a, a check that came in the mail from this community foundation in California. And I, it was a $10,000 check. And I thought it was a joke. I thought it was a piece of junk spam mail. Um, <laughs> But it was just that. It was a person who's been a visionary f- uh, funder of us, S- Sally Calhoun, with the Globetrotter Foundation in, in California, did does her giving through this community foundation. So that's why it wasn't identifiable to her. But she had learned about the Savannah Institute and learned about this transformative vision that, that we had. And it was clear to her, this is what needs to happen in the Midwest and in a lot of places. But the Midwest is so important for where the core of industrialized agriculture is that she said, this is the change I want to see in the world and I want to get behind. And she had the capacity to just send us a check. And, and so that was a moment for me where I was like, Oh, well, you know, there are people who have the means, whether it's, you know, big funders or small funders who want to see this change happen in the world. And so that's, that's how we're going to do it um, is we're all going to work on this together because it's a vision that we can all get behind in some way. Hmm. Glad you didn't throw that check away, or we might we might not be where we are today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I think so. Kind of building on that a little bit. So, you know, not only like you said, sometimes people find like the the scope of SI's vision maybe surprising uh, or or bigger than they might want to stomach. Um, but same with the kind of the breadth of our mission or the breadth of SI's activities also are, is, sometimes can be surprising for people or if SI takes up a new thing. Um, you know, mission creep is certainly thrown out a lot of the nonprofit world and people, you know, want to be very cautious and careful of that. But I think that, you know, it, for me, it's always been very clear that SI's had this really broad mission. And we talk about it a lot in that, like, you know, our mission is, is very focused on the Midwest, very focused on agroforestry. But within that, we do just about everything that a nonprofit uh, can legally do. <laughs> and so and, and because that all those things <laughs> need to happen. And so uh, kind of an analogy that uh, the way that I think about it now, and maybe this tells you a little bit about what I do in my days after work, but uh, is a, like a kid's coloring book where you have, you know, the ones where like, all the pages are already prepared for you. There's all the outlines ready to go. You just got to kind of color it in. And um, like for me, all, if you think about all those pages, there's like all the necessary elements for this transformation that is our vision. And we just have to get to work kind of coloring it all in and making it all happen. And so the way that I look is like as SI grows and, um, you know, takes on new things, we're not, we're not like designing new pages in that book and making new outlines. We're just... Um, kind of filling in slowly coloring in all the necessary pieces that need to happen. You know, the people before us have already laid out uh, what needs to be done. Like the mission is pretty clear from a kind of a movement perspective. That's not really uh, new or, or unknown. We're just kind of slowly uh, bringing color to it, filling it in. And sometimes uh, we're lucky and we get to fill in or, or color a whole page before moving on to the next one. And it kind of is a nice, logical, linear uh, path. 
Um, but other times we have to be opportunistic uh, with either funding or situations that arise and we need to skip ahead a few pages, color something in before we can come back and come back to this chapter and work on this. And, um, you know, so from the outside, sometimes it, it, you know, for any organization like this, it might look like, oh, we're, we're skipping around or we're, we're chasing something. But really, we're just trying to find the most kind of effective and efficient path <laughs> forward in transformation. And that is almost never linear and almost never direct. Um, there's a lot of, lot of roadblocks in the way that you have to, to drive around. Um, mm -hmm. And I think also, you know, it's important. Uh, kind of a, uh, this analogy carries through with the the bigger part of our role of you know we're not trying to hog the whole uh, coloring book like you know, a central part as Keith mentioned to SI's mission has been to enable as many other people and organizations as possible to pick up their own crayons and, and get to work you know uh, in general we try to only uh, pick up a specific piece of our mission if we can't find anyone else to do it first you know, if, there's, if there's if there's another organization or person out there that is, is already well equipped and, and has the skills and you know capacity to, to make something happen we don't need to reinvent the wheel we don't need well let's support them let's make that happen and let's fill in the gaps that um no one else is working on and you know i think a lot of people in our space know and understand like the core facets of agriculture that need to change and and kind of you know pe most people i think understand what the architecture of that coloring book already is but mm -hmm. then it's easy to think that some other institution is going to to do that to to, to tackle those things and so a size approach has been to not really point fingers at others or cross our fingers that someone is going to to do the thing, but to actually dive in and get our hands dirty and just start to start doing it. Yeah. To me, that sounds like a big part of the Savannah Institute origin too, is like you and other people seeing this need for more research and education around agroforestry and not seeing anyone doing it and saying like, well, I guess we're going to do it. And, and that seems to be a, a big part of, of the work we're continuing to try to do. I am almost scared to ask this because it's kind of scary to think this far into the future, but in another 10 years, uh, what are you hoping to see both in terms of the Savannah Institute and just in terms of Midwest agriculture? Um, what, what do you think is possible in the next 10 years? Well, I, I think the most important thing, you know, back to the coloring book analogy is that more people and institutions are picking up crayons and coloring because, you know, certainly SI is going to, going to, going to continue to grow, going to continue filling in more of our mission. I'm going to continue pushing the transition forward, but you know, we can't do this alone. We need to be doing all of this same work in additional regions and, and just doubling down everywhere. And so, you know, I think that is happening. We've already seen over the last few years just an acceleration of of both new organizations getting involved in the kind of perennialization of agriculture, but also existing organizations shifting and, and getting more focused on this. So um, I think that's what I hope to see over the next 10 years, and I do think it's possible, is just a bigger, bigger team uh, working on the per perennialization of agriculture. It's going to continue to feel overwhelming because the climate crisis is accelerating, sometimes it feels faster than we can make progress. And so like, it's going to continue to feel overwhelming. So I think that over the next 10 years, we need to also focus kind of organizationally, culturally on, on um, you know, keeping that in mind, but not losing focus, not losing not losing faith that that you know that we can that we can make make change happen and it's just going to become uh even more e even harder and even more important i would echo what kevin said um that for for the last few from the beginning but especially for the last few years we've been really focused strategically on not just how does savannah institute do more or do our work better but how do we catalyze and engage and empower other organizations, other individuals, farmers, uh, businesses, 
policymakers to bring agroforestry into their work. Um, because it's almost too obvious to say, but it's just so true that um, we really do need everybody engaged when our vision is to to transform the system. You know, Savannah Institute is only ever going to be a certain part of that. Um, And so, but I think we, we do have an important role, again, as a catalyst to getting other people inspired, informed, and helping them find the most... Um, appropriate and effective ways to to be a part of building more perennial, more diverse agriculture. So I I think that will continue to be a focus for the next 10 years. And, you know, I don't think we'll get there in 10 years, but my line is that one day we won't be calling it agroforestry. We'll just be calling it farming because that's, that's the way it's done. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that's maybe, maybe we will get there in 10 years. I would love to be surprised uh, about that. Um, what you just said, Keith, made me think of something relevant to some of the earlier kind of mission and vision, uh, points where from the beginning, probably from the first retreat that the SI board of directors had in the first year of, of SI's existence, um, it's, it, it was kind of a joke and it, it still is, I guess, but, but, um, the, we joked that the, SI's vision is basically to to create a world, an agricultural system in which SI's most important role was running a museum about the history of annual agriculture and why we transitioned away from it. Like that's where we want to get to that point. And, um, you know, we're not going to do that in the next 10 years, but um, I, I would love for that to be SI's main programmatic activity. We'll just run the Museum of Monocultures. <laughs> yes. Yep. Putting ourselves out of business. I like it. Two things we haven't talked about much that I think of as kind of big moments in recent history were um, canopy farm management starting up and then also Savannah Institute purchasing land in the Spring Green area, which I, I think have both been kind of, you know, in the in your long-term vision for, for probably many years before it happened. And just in the last couple of years, it's, you know, it's come together and become a reality. So could you maybe say a little bit about what kind of how you built towards those two big things? And then, um, yeah, I don't know that we need to get into it that much, but I just like to kind of include it in and thinking about the origins of Savannah Institute. Yeah, I meant to talk a little bit about the, the canopy piece in the kind of next 10 years question. Um, so, so I think a big part of where we want to work towards in the next 10 years is just making agroforestry and tree crops easier options for farmers and landowners. Right now, it is difficult to find information Hopefully it's easier than it was 10 years ago before the Savannah Institute started. Um, but it's, it's, it's difficult to know how to start, what to do next, uh, when, when you're a farmer or landowner and you're hearing about trees for the first time. Um, and so I think a, a big theme in SI's current work and, and next 10 years of work is, is that idea of just making agroforestry and tree crops an easier option for farmers and landowners to, to adopt. And certainly, uh, the recent spinoff of Canopy Farm Management is, is a major kind of step in that direction, a major uh, cornerstone of that theme in that the main goal of Canopy is to make the establishment and management of the trees themselves super easy for farmers. You know, Canopy has the expertise, has the equipment, has the team to do all of that in a really effective and efficient way and farmers and landowners can theoretically choose to adopt a tree-based system work with canopy and and that farmer lander doesn't have to 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 lift a finger anymore compared to what they are doing right now with with corn and beans for example and so that's a really important step in that direction but there are many other kind of uh, commercialization and, and R&D type uh, 
paths that we have to go down in a similar vein to make different aspects of the supply chain easier, reduce barriers so that it can be flooded by by uh, you know, many uh, farmers and entrepreneurs down the road. Canopy launched, I guess, at end of 2021, start of 2022. Canopy's first first tree planting season was was spring 2022. That's kind of how we mark mm-hmm. times, mark time right. at Canopy is <laughs> tree planting mm-hmm. seasons. Okay. And the only, I think that's all really great perspective. The only thing I would add to it, and Kevin, I've heard you say this before too, is you know part of the purpose of Savannah Institute spinning off Canopy as its own vehicle, its own business, is so that Savannah Institute can continue to stay focused on our bread and butter, the research, the outreach, the education. And this part of our mission, which is making it easy for landowners, like Kevin described, that th- that there's a business set up to do that is really the the appropriate vehicle for that. Because ultimately, a nonprofit has an important part in the whole ecosystem of agriculture, but most agriculture happens in the sort of the broader commercial world. And so having a business that can operate in that broader world um, was a part of the strategy for Savannah Institute to keep our focus on our bread and butter and have a, a business that can really push that part of our mission forward. Yeah. And then um, maybe to give a little perspective on uh, the Spring Green Campus and the story there. Mm-hmm. So you know, as we talked about uh, Savannah Institute in the early years, we did a lot of our work as a part of a network of farms and partners. And a lot of our programs were research that we did in partnership with those farms, educational events that we did in partnership uh, with those farms and with universities. And and we still do a lot of that uh, more than ever, and we'll continue to do that. But it, I think it was uh, maybe our, our board of directors retreat in 2018. We had um, our first really in-depth conversation about the parts of our mission that um, weren't really a good fit to do with partner farms. That there were some parts of uh, R and D that were risky, and asking independent farms to take those risks was, um, you know, in- inappropriate, in- in- and you know could put those farms in a in a place that got them in trouble. You know, great if folks want to take risks, but um, we don't want to be asking them or pressuring them to take those risks. So let's do it ourselves. Let's let's take those risks ourselves. Some parts of our research that are really long term uh, projects, uh, plant breeding and looking at ecological effects and carbon sequestration over long time periods, that that can be really difficult to do with farms and with university uh, research sites where there's just more uncertainty about what will that farm be there long term? Will the people be the same? Will we just have access to continue to do that research? Um, And then some in-depth educational programs, in-depth trainings, and uh, certain types of uh, apprenticeships and and that sort of thing that uh, and and really a place uh, to welcome people to say if you want to come to the savannah institute where where do you come to where can we uh, help folks learn about who we are and what we do and and all those things uh, that were part of our mission we didn't really have a home for and so we developed a vision for what what we at that point called a home farm for the Savannah Institute. And as we sort of detailed, filled out that vision, sort of, you know, like Kevin's metaphor of the coloring book, we sort of, you know, sketched out that page of what a a home farm looks like and what the purpose it would serve. Um, Then we started to look for opportunities and places that would would work for that. And we looked pretty broadly. Uh, Eventually we narrowed down the spring green area as really a special area where there was this incredible community of of farmers that had been doing innovative things for a long time with uh, Dick Cates and other managed grazing, rotational grazing, uh, organic farmers like Gary Zimmer, some really great uh, fruit farmers, uh, different different crops doing things um, in, in innovative ways that had and, and the, a watershed group there, farmer-led watershed group organized around water quality. And then beyond the farmers as well, just a, a really vibrant 
community of conservationists uh, and artists and um, and community members who we could see would support what we're doing. Um, and then as we started to talk to folks and say, here's who we are, here's what we're looking for, some people we already knew and we met new people, um, opportunities came up where a farm was looking for what's going to happen with the next generation of this farm. And so we sort of mapped on our vision for our, our needs of our institute and our mission with uh, a few farms in Spring Green that were looking for what's next in the story of this farm. And so that's where we've been really fortunate is we found uh, several farms clustered around Spring Green that meet our needs for long-term research projects, for uh, educational possibilities, building in the, the, the programming there for intensive training and and public engagement. You know, there's a lot of people who, even though it's a rural area, a farming community, there's a lot of people that come from all over the world to Spring Green. Um, for uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin is there. It's a World Heritage Site. There's the, the American Players Theater, which is a uh, nationally recognized theater. So people come to Spring Green, and, if, and now what we're finding is as people come, they get to know Savannah Institute and, and get inspired by what we're doing and want to be a part of it. And so that's an important part of having a home too. So that, that's how the Spring Green Campus really came to be. And, and it's just been incredible to see in just a few short years that we've uh, started to put down roots in Spring Green, how um, the community has been so supportive of us in Spring Green. And, and we've become a part of the community and able to not just push Savannah Institute's agenda, so to speak, but as we become a part of the community, um, becoming a part of supporting other aspects of what the community is doing too, like being a part of the farmer-led watershed group, for example, and, um, and other things happening too, partnering with Taliesin on events and, and things like that. So it's really an, an amazing uh, place to be, and I'm just so grateful for all the folks that have welcomed us uh, to be a part of, of the Spring Green community, and I think it's a really good home. Uh, for Savannah Institute. Of course, it's not the only home for Savannah Institute. It's We continue to have a, a staff and an office and demonstration farms in Illinois, and that's a really important home for the Institute. And wherever, you know, a network of farms who are mentors that host apprentices through our apprenticeship program, I think of each of these farms as a home of the idea or the mission of Savannah Institute. But um, but the Spring Green Campus can do that in some special, some special ways too. So that's the story is still being written, but that's my take on where we are so far. Great. All right, I think we covered those pretty well, and I think we can wrap up with uh, these agroforestry would you rather's. Um, and I I know that the two of you served as co executive directors for five years, I believe, is what we decided. Um, but I won't make you agree. So you don't have to reach a consensus on these. So, um, the first one, uh, is would you rather raise goats, pigs, or chickens? Chickens for sure. Chickens are the only one I've ever actually raised. And I've, I've worked a little bit with goats. I think they're great for eating invasive species, but I wouldn't want to be responsible for goats. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, what makes you say chickens? Um, I feel like because there's in the, in the same area, you have a lot more of smaller units. There's just a lot more creative things you can do to play around with their, their movement and dividing and conquering and, and moving them. Yeah. Around to make different, okay. different goals happen. Yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, this next one, think about it for yourself, not for Savannah Institute, but would you rather have 10 acres of prime mature agroforestry or a hundred acres of bare ground to work with? I'd say bare ground because that's, that's what, that's what needs, needs the help, needs the TLC. Wouldn't would mind, yeah. uh, having a house with a couple, with a couple of mature trees around it. That, <laughs> that would be nice to start with a little bit of shade. Yeah. I suppose with a would you rather, you can't, you can't say both. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I've asked a few, a few different people these questions now, which is, it's fun to hear the different answers. And with this question, a lot of people have said like, 
how old am I? Is it like my current age or is this when I'm older? And that, so I think that's an interesting way to break it down. I think I would go with the 10 acres because there there's a lot of people who have 100 acres of bare ground and I'm happy to help them with that. <laughs> Um, but if it's a place where I could hang my hat, then I would, yeah, like to have the shade of, of trees to enjoy. So you're saying it would be easy to find more bare ground, but it's hard to find a, a nice agroforestry planting. And I, yeah. I'm happy to share too, but, um, <laughs> that's where I would want to hang out. That's a good answer. Okay. Uh, this one might be a little too close to reality, but would you rather work in a place that has frequent flooding, constant drought or frequent wind storms? I'd probably go with flooding. I'm pretty pretty done with the wind after living in central Illinois. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there there are lots of ways to slow and uh, move water around. Uh, it's, it's harder to generate water out of out of nothing. I would go with frequent flooding too, even though um, I've b- from. Uh, Gaze Mills in the Driftless area where f- floods have really wrecked that community and so I have a lot of um, sort of my own trauma around floods but it's also you know what I associate with home and and it's actually a big motivation for me is our you know land use and getting more perennial cover on the hills is a place is a way that we can reduce the impact of floods because we get more infiltration um, instead of runoff when we have perennial agriculture happening. So working in a place with frequent flooding and, and being a part of mitigating uh, the, that risk of floods is, is actually really meaningful and important to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last one. Would you rather work with someone who doesn't know how to use any of the equipment or someone who is always grouchy? I would work with the, um, with the, the rookie, with the novice, because I feel like it's easier to learn how to use equipment than it is to learn how to not be grouchy. Um, <laughs> or at least I'm more confident that I could teach someone how to <laughs> use equipment than teach someone how to not be grouchy. That seems kind of impossible or, or depending on who it is. I think I would take the grouch. Um, <laughs> I feel like uh, uh, taming a grouch is often mostly about figuring out what kind of beer they like and then forming a relationship <laughs> around that <laughs> and um, figuring out where you can where you, where you have common grounds, where you can grouch about the same things. If you can, if you can grouch with a grouch about the same the same things, you can find some common ground and then and then work together. Heavy equipment that they're going to be <laughs> operating for. <now. laughs> All right. Well, I think we've gotten some insights into your working relationship right there. So uh, thank you both for doing the Would You Rathers. And uh, thanks for taking the time to talk through the origins of Savannah Institute. Uh, anything you want to say before we, we wrap up the recording and sign off here? I really want to just emphasize that, you know, while while Kevin and I have been privileged to be a part of getting agroforestry in the Midwest going, getting Savannah Institute going, there's um, a long line of people who came before us, you know, going right back to why we're called the Savannah Institute, the Oak Savannahs here in the Midwest, which are these incredible agricultural ecosystems that native people uh, have and continue to steward here um, that are incredibly diverse, productive, abundant, resilient uh, places where there's, um, you know, resources for humans to survive and lots of other kinds of creatures too. And, and then, you know, through folks who've been a part of envisioning what um, agriculture in our current era can look like um, from, you know, J. Russell Smith and tree crops came up um, to Mark Shepard came up and many folks in between there. So, and then, and that's just looking back. And then even in our 10 years, you know, while Kevin and I have had our place in the story, it's really always been about this, this community vision um, 
and the community, like I say, the, the wind in our sails and, um, and really, you know, the whole crew of the ship too. So that's, I, I think that's just really important to, you know, I think it's great that we're having this conversation here, but it's certainly the only reason Savannah Institute has had any success that it's had has been the community of uh, farmers, volunteers, staff, board members, etc. The list goes on. Um, and that, um, if we have any success in the future, it'll be because of that too. So, so a lot of that goes without saying, but I didn't want to go without saying it. <laughs> You've been listening to my conversation with Keith Keeley and Kevin Wohls in honor of the 10th anniversary of the Savannah Institute this year. Keith and Kevin worked together as co-executive directors of the Institute from 2017 to 2022. Keefe continues to serve as executive director, and Kevin now works as CEO of Canopy Farm Management. Kevin helped found the Savannah Institute in 2013, and Keefe was hired as their first staff member in 2014. I think this also goes without saying, but our organization would not be where it is today without the two of them. If you're in the Midwest and you'd like to see agroforestry in action, check out the upcoming events on our website. We've already begun hosting field days for this season, and we have lots more coming up. You can also read more about the last 10 years of the Savannah Institute in our latest perennial report, which is now available at savannahinstitute.org. If you have something you'd like to hear on this podcast, or a question you'd like to ask, or a story you'd like to tell, please let me know. Leave us a voicemail at 608-448-6432 or send us a message on social media at Savannah Institute, and it'll find its way to me. Thanks for listening. If you want to get our newest episodes when they come out, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. And if you're really feeling inspired and want to help us out, you can rate this podcast and write a review. It only takes a second, and it really helps this podcast get heard by more people. That's it for me. Keep up the good work out there, take lots of breaks, and keep it perennial AF. Want to see a future that's perennial AF? If you're listening to this podcast, there's a good chance you're already taking steps to make that happen. But did you know you don't have to be a farmer or a researcher to make a big AF impact on climate change? Here at the Savannah Institute, we lay the groundwork for widespread agroforestry throughout the Midwest, conducting the research, education, and outreach necessary to transform agriculture and combat climate change. But we can't do this alone, even with our rock star lineup of tree crop breeders and community agroforesters and technical service providers. Transformative change requires a community of people working together, and we need you. Becoming a monthly donor is one of the best ways to be a part of the transformation and affect positive change for our climate. Visit our website at savannahinstitute.org give to learn more.